This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gitu Yort. It's Friday, June 11th. Welcome to Africa 54. We continue to work remotely because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But what hasn't changed is our commitment to bringing you the latest and most important news from the African continent and around the world. Here is today's Africa 54. We begin our broadcast in Ethiopia, where hundreds of thousands of people in Ethiopia's conflict hit Tigray region are reportedly living in famine conditions, according to an internal United Nations document. At one hospital in the region, the horrors of hunger are playing out for a 14-year-old boy. Africa 54 managing editor Vincent McCory has the details. Eden Mwezi's uncle says the 14-year-old used to be as strong as a lion. But having spent months hiding in a cave to escape violence in Ethiopia's Tigray region, he weighs less than 15 kilograms or under two and a half stone. An analysis by United Nations agencies and aid groups estimates some 350,000 people in the conflict-torn region are in famine conditions. Eden's uncle, Tedese Eregawi, says they hid in the cave for more than three months. We were only eating roasted barley. Six people died and we had to bury them during the evening, as it wasn't possible to do it during the day. Famine has been declared twice in the last decade, in Somalia in 2011 and South Sudan in 2017. For famine to be officially declared, at least 20% of the population must be suffering extreme food shortages, with one in three children acutely malnourished and two people out of every 10,000 dying daily from starvation or from malnutrition and disease. The Ethiopian government disputes the analysis from the integrated food security phase classification. It says food shortages are not severe and aid is being delivered. Mitiku Kasa is Ethiopia's aid chief and national disaster risk management commissioner. We don't have any food shortage. So that it, it is not time. It is not a position to declare famine in current Tigray regional state context. War broke out in November between federal forces and the rebellious Tigray People's Liberation Front. On Wednesday, the UN spokesperson to the Secretary General, Stefan Dujaric, said there had been reports of humanitarian movement being denied and the looting and the confiscation of humanitarian assets and supplies by parties to the conflict. Of the accessible areas, the situation is dire, including... He said several areas of Tigray remain inaccessible. Level of food insecurity and malnutrition are at alarming levels. At a hospital in Adigrad, Adam struggles to breathe. He weighs a third of the normal weight for a boy's age. His uncle says Adam hoped to grow up and achieve a good life, but that due to a lack of food, he is where he is now. That was Africa 54 managing editor Vincent McCory reporting. French President Emmanuel Macron has declared an end to Balkane counterterrorism operation in West Africa's Sahel. Macron says that soldiers will now operate as part of a wider international effort in the region. David Doyle has the details. France's operation battling jihadist militants in the Sahel region of West Africa is to come to an end. President Emmanuel Macron making that announcement on Thursday. Bonjour and saying that French troops will instead operate as part of broader international efforts in the region. Referring to the 5,100 strong Barkhane counter-terrorism force, Macron said the time has come to begin a deep transformation of our military presence in the Sahel. Impossible. Ou alors un travail sans fin. The former colonial power has claimed some success against militants in recent months. But the situation remains extremely fragile and with no apparent end in sight, Paris has grown frustrated. Some 55 soldiers have died since France first intervened in 2013. Political turmoil has also been a concern. 
The troop reduction decision comes just days after Malian Army Colonel Asimi Goita took power after overthrowing his second president in nine months. Earlier on Thursday, French Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian was in Ivory Coast cutting the ribbon on a new counter-terrorism academy. He said the International Academy for the Fight Against Terrorism in Abidjan would help regional states step up their military, security and judicial cooperation. Macron said details of the changes would be finalised by the end of June. That's after consultations with the United States, European nations involved in the region and the five Sahel countries, Mali, Niger, Chad, Burkina Faso and Mauritania. David Doyle of Reuters filed that report. Park rangers in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo have arrested a militia leader, an alleged ivory trafficker whose fighters are accused of killing 19 rangers, according to authorities. The Congolese Institute for Nature Conservation said in a statement on Thursday that Jackson Mohokaboto, a former army officer who has led various militias in and around Virunga National Park, was detained in the city of Butembo on Tuesday. Virunga, Africa's oldest national park, home to over half the world's mountain gorillas and hundreds of elephants, has been plagued by violence since the late 1990s. In a recent interview with VOS Medina Dauda, the U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria, Mary Beth Leonard, spoke about the role of development initiatives in sustaining a solid security partnership between Nigeria and the United States. We are a very solid security partner for Nigeria, and I don't only mean that in a, in a physical security stance, right? Because uh, challenges to security are more than just about a physical response. While there may be very many different reasons for insecurity in Nigeria, for example, I think we would all agree that lack of opportunity underpins many of them. Um, and so the United States is very involved in programs to create such opportunities. And of course, there's the hard security side, which is our assistance to police and, and security forces. We have a very long-standing partnership and some of those elements, you know, we're a great partner, sometimes we're not a very fast partner. Uh, some of those programs are, are coming to fruition with the delivery of some equipment uh, later this summer. But it's about equipment, it's about training, it's about joint exercises, it's about enhancing the capability of forces to be uh, nimble responders and effective responders uh, in service of protecting Nigeria's citizens. So we're very proud in the United States to work in all three of those areas. Uh, and in 2021, we have um, uh, been continuing conversations about where do we need to go next. That was U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria, Mary Beth Leonard, speaking to Voice of America's House of Service reporter, Medina Dauda in Abuja, Nigeria. U.S. President Joe Biden has formally announced that his administration is donating 500 million doses of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine to 92 low- and middle-income countries. We get more from White House correspondent Patsy Wida Kuswara, who is traveling with the president. Following his summit with this year's G7 host, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, a major announcement from U.S. President Joe Biden. The United States will purchase a half a billion doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine to donate to nearly 100 nations that are in dire need in the fight against this pandemic. 200 million of these Pfizer vaccines will be delivered by the end of 2021 and 300 million by June of next year. They are in addition to the 80 million already committed by the U.S. to be delivered by the end of the month. Our vaccine donations don't include pressure for favors or potential concessions. We're doing this to save lives, to end this pandemic. By announcing his vaccine donation plans on the eve of the G7 summit, a meeting of the world's leading industrial nations, Biden is pushing the group of wealthy countries to follow his lead. He is also rejecting accusations that the U.S. is a vaccine hoarder. He's trying to signal that America isn't um, intensely parochial and inward focused, which I think has been a deep concern not only through the Trump years, but quite frankly through the pandemic. When for so long um, the United States just simply wasn't sharing the vaccine. Um, so I think this is, you know, he's come under pressure uh, globally to do this, um, to take a leadership role. Hours after Biden's announcement, Johnson said Britain would give at least 100 million surplus vaccine doses. He expects the G7 to agree to donate a billion doses during the summit, scheduled to begin Friday. 
Pfizer makes mRNA vaccines produced not by using weakened forms of the virus, but by using the pathogen's genetic codes. So far, data show that none of the existing variant strains has escaped the protection provided by our vaccine. While activists welcome Biden's move, they want wealthy nations to do more to help vaccinate the world, especially those nations that have more doses than they need in the pipeline. While those doses don't exist today, and of course countries have an obligation to really accelerate the vaccination programs of their domestic populations, they have purchased contracts for more than they need. They need to negotiate now to direct those surplus doses to countries in need. This is the urgent thing that the G7 needs to agree. The doses will be delivered through COVAX, the United Nations vaccine sharing mechanism. It will cost American taxpayers $3.5 billion, $2 billion of which will be paid with funding already pledged to COVAX. Traveling with the president at the G7 in Cornwall, Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News. Experts say Russia is working to discredit Western vaccines and aggressively marketing its own Sputnik V jab. Anush Avietsyan has the story. By the time the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved the use of the Pfizer vaccine to fight COVID-19 in December 2020, a Russian disinformation campaign was already underway, suggesting the vaccine was dangerous, even deadly. Russian media outlets and online postings pushed baseless claims of people dying after receiving the Pfizer jab, or that both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines caused blood clots. World Health Organization officials say these false claims by Russia are designed to undermine confidence in the vaccines being produced by the West. What we call the infodemic is as big a problem as the pandemic. The infodemic is indeed this information that's being spread all around the world. It spreads more quickly than the virus itself. But Russia is not alone in its disinformation campaign. The European External Action Service said in its latest report that both pro-Kremlin media outlets and China are working to undermine trust in European and U.S. vaccines. U.S. officials say they are doing what they can to fight back against the tide of disinformation. We work uh, with a wide variety of partners, um, from other governments to civil society organizations, uh, to counter this. I think that, you know, particularly in the context of a global pandemic, where it's incredibly important to uh, have people vaccinated, that there's a hunger for the truth. And thankfully, I think there's a growing number of organizations that are ensuring that people get it. The result of all this disinformation is that it makes fighting the pandemic more difficult. Sowing mistrust in vaccines also harms Russia, say disinformation experts, by creating distrust among Russians themselves for the country's own Sputnik V vaccine. Anusha Vitisyan, VOA News, Washington. Residents around Washington, D.C. are increasingly out and about as COVID-19 cases fall in the capital region. But reluctance to get vaccinated persists in some quarters despite extensive campaigns promoting inoculation. VOA's Laura Bowman has more. Even on this cold and cloudy day in the nation's capital, fans of the Washington Nationals baseball team were out in droves with expanded capacity allowing for roughly 15,000 people. I was kind of worried coming here, but from what friends have told me and how they run things at the park, it, I, I feel so comfortable like it's 2019 all over again. With COVID-19 deaths and cases plummeting in the Washington region, authorities are giving businesses the green light to resume most operations after more than a year of heavy restrictions. For Washington Nationals fans, this means masks aren't required for gamegoers who are at least two weeks past a second vaccine dose. We got him his first shot the other day, so we're excited in a few weeks that you know, all of us will be vaccinated and we feel a little bit safer. In the Washington suburb of Arlington, Virginia, restaurant owner Peter Botta is relieved that his once closed business is back at full capacity. We are operating at 100% now without social distancing. So this has been great for our business. It's been great. I believe that customers feel a lot more comfortable because they're out 
They're, they're happy, they're excited, the place is alive again. But U.S. vaccination rates are not uniform. Vaccine hesitancy remains higher in many African American and other minority communities. And data suggests a partisan divide has emerged on whether to get the jab. For example, a recent Gallup poll found that almost half of unvaccinated Republicans, 46%, don't plan on getting inoculated, compared to 6% of Democrats. Democrats are likelier than Republicans to sort of support government mandates for things. Uh, I think you know Republicans generally a little bit more of the anti-government party, a little bit more skeptical. National debates aside, nine-year-old Jaden Anthony is happy to have his mask off so he can eat his bacon. So if people are wearing masks less now, we can get a little closer to each other and I can make new friends. And then it's also easier to get to know them better. For him and others, spring brings the promise of leaving a long COVID-19 winter behind. Laurel Bowman, VOA News, Washington. We want to know what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. Our address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, a virtual conversation with one of Congo's veteran musicians, Noel Ngiyama Makanda, popularly known as Warasan. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Africa 54. Ransomware cases are on the rise worldwide and criminal groups based in Russia are suspected of being behind some of the biggest recent attacks. Michelle Quinn reports on the changing world of ransomware. Colonial Pipeline CEO Joseph Blount recalls the moment he decided to pay $5 million in ransom to hackers who cut off the company's access to internal files. It was the hardest decision I've made in my 39 years in the energy industry, and I know how critical our pipeline is to the country, and I put the interests of the country first. Colonial is among the recent victims in the U.S. of what experts say is a rising tide of ransomware cases, computer system attacks that hobble operations until the organization pays a ransom. Over the past year, hackers have targeted critical infrastructure, hospitals, transportation agencies, food suppliers. Operations are borderless, and payment is in cryptocurrency, making it hard to catch the criminals. Hackers use multiple ways to exploit computer system vulnerabilities, including phishing emails that trick employees into opening attachments that launch the malware that infects the network. Once in, the hackers lock down the system, encrypt the locks and leave instructions on who to pay to unlock the system. Hackers copy sensitive files and use the threat of releasing the files publicly as a threat in payment negotiations. Once paid, often by cryptocurrency that is hard to trace, the hackers provide decryption keys to unlock the files. The newest twist is the professionalism of hacking. Hackers offer ransomware software so that criminal organizations can get in on the action, experts say. The bad guys have got better, and we've effectively completely lost sight of the true nature of the problem, which is there is now this affiliate or partner model, and they're effectively going out and hiring individuals to break into companies to exploit vulnerabilities that, quite frankly, are not, not sophisticated. Officials say U.S. law enforcement recovered $2.3 million of Colonial's ransom, money that reportedly was going to a Russia-based gang of cyber criminals. Next week, President Joseph Biden is expected to raise the issue of Russia as a haven for cyber crime with Russian President Vladimir Putin when the two leaders meet in Geneva. 
the involvement of Biden and European leaders is a signal that these hacks are being taken more seriously, say experts. They're going to be taking more and more steps to actually come after this, not anymore uh, just as a cyber crime challenge, but as a national security threat. And that will bring significantly more resources to bear on the problem. The Biden administration has issued a warning to all organizations from big business to small towns that now is the time to improve their cybersecurity and defend against ransomware attacks. Michelle Quinn, VOA News. NASA sends squids to space. Plus, the world's wealthiest man makes out of this world travel arrangements. And a soccer star talks game with an orbiting astronaut. VOA's Arash Basadi brings us the week in space. Two, one, zero. Ignition. This week, from a launch pad at Florida's Let's Cape Canaveral, go private spaceflight company Dragon. SpaceX launched its 22nd commercial resupply services mission to the International Space Station. The CRS-22 delivered more than 3,300 kilograms of cargo, including the first two new solar arrays to help power the ISS. Also on board CRS-22 were 128 newly hatched bobtail squid. Sea creatures in space are part of an experiment called Understanding Microgravity on Animal-Microbe Interactions, or UMAMI. The University of Florida's Jamie Foster explains why. We all have microbes that are helping our bodies uh, with our digestive system, with our immune systems. Microbes are essential for our health, animal health. And so what we don't really understand, the full mechanisms of communication, the dialogue that's happening, uh, between microbes and animal cells. And we know even less when we're in the space environment. Foster says the project aims to understand how the stressors of space impact the healthy interactions between microbes and hosts. She says squid have similar immune systems to humans, but as they are simpler animals, researching their microbial interactions makes an easier model to understand the effects of space flight on more complex animals like humans which could be good news for the world's wealthiest human. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos announced this week his plans to join the first crew aboard his Blue Origin capsule. You see the Earth from space, it changes you. It changes your relationship with this planet, with humanity. It's one Earth. I want to go on this flight because it's a thing I've wanted to do all my life. It's an adventure. It's a big deal for me. It will likely also be a big deal for Bezos' brother and fireman, Mark Bezos, whom Jeff invited along for the 10-minute hop aboard the New Shepard suborbital vehicle. It will be the first time a capsule with crew flies attached to the New Shepard, and its flight date of July 20th falls on the anniversary of the 1969 Apollo 11 moon landing. And finally this week, a video call between French ESA astronaut Thomas Pesquet and French soccer superstar Kylian Mbappe. Pesquet, floating aboard the ISS, compared the flight to space to a roller coaster ride with 10,000 times the power. He also complained to Mbappe about the difficulties of playing soccer in space, saying the ball goes up but never goes down. Mbappe will soon be playing soccer on Earth at the pandemic delayed European Football Championships. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News. In entertainment news, veteran musician and producer Noel Ngiyama Makanda, widely known as Warason, has been a seminal figure in Congolese music since the early 1980s. VOA's ethnomusicologist and host of Music Time in Africa, Heather Maxwell, joins him in this virtual conversation to talk about his music today and its role in developing undiscovered Congolese talent. Hello, where are son? It is nice to see you. <laughs> so what are you doing in the United States? I'm in the United States because I have my family here and then I also went to Dallas. Some, a friend of mine invited me to a wedding. This is the main reason why I'm here. Was it difficult to travel under COVID restrictions? It was easy because before traveling I had to take a test and now I took my test and uh, without that I couldn't travel. 
where are some? This is your band, Wenge Musica Maison Mère, right? Oui, exactly. Yeah, it's my band, Wenge Musica Maison Mère. I'm the, I'm the one that created it. Uh, it's my band. Since like 1997, is it? Oui, ça fait... Since then, I work with my band. People come and, and leave. And uh, today, I still continue to recruit people that come in my band to play with me. And they come and they go. What are you singing about in this song? What is Formidable? I'm singing about everything that makes you happy. And when you see my clip, you can tell that everything inside is formidable. Formidable the dance, formidable people inside. I'm talking about just the world being formidable and the joy of dancing. Well, one thing that is formidable that I hear is your voice. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's my own voice, as you can see. Uh, I don't force anything. I just sing naturally. So thank you so much for the compliment. Jamaique also is very talented. I noticed that when he comes in near the middle of the song, the rhythm and the tempo change. Is that his signature? Is that centre de formation? Yeah, you are right. Uh, uh, Jamaique is very talented, but uh, most of what he is doing in the clip, as you see, is the orientation that I give to them. And uh, most of them just come and then they don't know exactly what to do. But it's about what exactly I want to show with his talent that I put something on him to do something. So I'm going to suggest you, if you'd like, to take a look on one of my clips called Block Cadena. There is a young boy over there. He's playing the guitar. I'm, I'm sure you're going to like it. You're going to like it and we're going to see how much I can use talent to make them give the best of them. What does this gesture mean? <laughs> As you said, it, I'm a showman, so uh, the move that you talk about is just, you know, I'm doing stuff to make people dance and then to motivate people. It just, you know, it's what I do. As a showman, you have to do stuff to make people dance and then that's all I do. If you come to my concert, you'll see how much I can motivate people. Even those uh, that don't want to dance, they can dance if I do that. Okay, well, Ngaima, Ngaima Makanda Werason, King of the Forest. Thank you so much for joining me today and taking the time out from your family time here in the U.S. I really, I really enjoyed speaking with you and I'm sure our audiences are, are really happy to. Hey Dave, how much thank you. It's very, and Michelle, it's very nice. How much I love you. Thank you. That's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a great weekend.